morning, church. Great to see you. Happy Memorial Day. And uh, man, let's jump in, all right? Get you, I know you're here with your kids. Thank you so much for sitting with your kids. Thank you to our children's ministry, all right? They do a great job, and they, we're giving them a little bit of a break on Memorial Day weekend. Get your Bible out. Turn with me to Romans 13. We're going to look at Romans, first seven verses of Romans 13. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's probably a ch- one in the chair in front of you. Uh, and if you don't own a Bible, do me a favor, take that one with you. We'd love for you to have a copy of the Word of God, uh, especially if you'll read that on a regular basis. We're in the middle of a little mini-series called God and Government. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to start in the book of Acts, and we're going to go through the book of Acts through the summer, and uh, looking forward to doing that together as a church. I, uh, so the story of the Bible, uh, all great stories, I really believe, is take their story from the Bible. And the story of the Bible, I heard one commentator said, it can be summed up this way. The story of the Bible is the king sends the prince to slay the dragon and get the girl. You got to know your Bible to get that one, all right? So the king, God the Father, sends his son to kill all of his enemies, including the serpent, right, Satan, and to get the church, the bride of Christ, right? The king sent the prince to slay the dragon and get the girl. And so at the beginning of this is this idea of leadership and rulership. And so we're talking about government, but last week we talked about at the end of the day, who is in charge of all governments and all governing officials, right? It's God the Father. And God did something extraordinary. We have a human condition called sin. Every single one of us in this room uh, is a sinner. And what we deserve by our king is his punishment and his wrath because he's holy, He's without sin. He's, he's deserving of our obedience and our heart of worship. He's deserving of all of that. But apart from Christ, we have rebelled against our king. And what we deserve is his wrath and his penalty. But our king did something extraordinary. He gave his one and only son, Jesus, and Jesus came on the planet, and Jesus took on flesh. He's the only person that walked the planet that lived a perfect life, who didn't deserve to die, yet Jesus chose death. And by choosing death, he hung on the cross, and on the cross, he paid a debt for sin that he didn't owe. On the cross, Jesus paid for Sean Brown's sin so that one day when I stand before the king, I can let the king know that because of his promises and his character and his son Jesus, my debt has been paid by Jesus. And yours can be too, okay? And so he paid a debt he didn't know. That's why when he hung on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? He's bearing the wrath for my sin on himself. He died on the cross and they laid his lifeless body in a grave. And if that was the end of the story, it'd be a martyr's story. But to authenticate his claims as being the son of God, the Messiah, and the only way to God, he bodily rose from the grave. He stepped out of his own grave. And the scriptures say, when we repent of sin, turn from sin, believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he bodily rose from the grave. We believe those things. Then the righteousness of Christ, his perfect works of righteousness, are credited to our spiritual bank account by grace through faith. Thereby, one day when I stand in front of the king, I will not only have my sins forgiven, but I will also be clothed in the perfect works of Christ by grace through faith. Thereby, I as now an heir, a child of God, get to share in the inheritance of Jesus for all of eternity. Isn't that amazing? And that is what we call that the gospel, the good news. In this in-between time, God has set up governments to help rule and, and organize, if you will, countries. And that's a good thing. Otherwise, it would be tyranny and chaos and anarchy, right? And so God has set up these leaders under his rule and reign until we get to eternity Future. And so today we're going to talk about our response to the government according to the Apostle Paul. Uh, one of the things that you probably don't know that we do when in our seven campuses on Tuesday, all of the preaching pastors that are preaching a particular text. Uh, We, two weeks in advance, were supposed to come together having done our homework, done our study, done our prayer, done our manuscript. We all get in a room and we talk about what we're going to preach. We bounce ideas off of each other. It's a really healthy thing that we do. And so two weeks ago, 
when we were preparing for this week's text, in the room with us was a student from Liberty University. And this student was a follower of Jesus. As you guys know, we do some missions with a church in Jordan, the country of Jordan. And, uh, and so because of that relationship with Liberty University and our church doing missions, we were able, they're starting to send some students to Liberty University. And so the student's name was Daywood. And Daywood was sitting in our planning meeting as we were talking about how we as Christians are to respond to our governing authorities. And so I asked Daywood, I already, I kind of knew, I didn't prep him, but because I've been in Jordan and been with the church leaders in Jordan, I knew what they thought about their king. King Abdullah II has been ruling in Jordan since 1999. He's been the king for almost 24 years, right? And so I asked Daywood in front of all the pastors, I said, what do you think about King Abdullah? What do you think he said? Predominantly Muslim country. He, his face lights up. He starts smiling. And he goes, oh, oh, we love our king. And he goes on to list all of the reasons why they love their king. And I thought about it. I said, got done, I said how many American Christians, if I was interviewing church members on the way out the door, and I said, what do you think about President Joe Biden? How many of them would go, oh, we love our president. <laughs> I love that. Man, I actually left thinking, I wish we would respond that way. There's an honor to that. I also, every time I'm, I talk to the Christians in Jordan, there's a part of me I'm a little bit envious, but when you have a king that you love for 24 years, there's actually a stability to that, to where our culture every four years is like, oh, here we go, here we go, right? It's like, oh, man, oh, man, and we all get geared up. And, and so today, I want to. I certainly can't give us all the riverbanks, but I want to go quickly through Romans 13, because the Apostle Paul gives us some riverbanks of how we as Christians should respond to government. Number one. We are to be subject to our civil authorities or to our government officials. Number one, we're to be subject to our civil authorities. Romans 13, 1. Check this out. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Okay? So letter A, Christians are to be good citizens. All right? We, we and, and, you, and it's really interesting as I've been prepping for this God and Government series, I've been reading through Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is a prophet. He's kind of the last prophet before the nation of Israel gets sent into exile. And one of his prophecies that he says to the nation over and over, I'm going to send you in a foreign land. I want you to go into that foreign land and plant roots. I want you to go into that foreign land and build families and build businesses and, and be a blessing to the, the country that I'm going to send you to. We, we're, as Christians, we live in such a way as to be subject to and honor the authorities that God has placed over us. The goal of a Christian is to live a peaceful life and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in better governing institutions. I'm not saying we shouldn't work for that. I'm just saying that's not our hope. Our hope is in that the gospel transforms the hearts of men and women one heart at a time and leavens our community. And so as Christians, we are to be subject to our governing authorities. That's one riverbank. Let me give you the other riverbank, though, okay? Letter B, Christians cannot disobey God's law. So if a governing authority gives us a law that's in opposition to the law of God, we have to honor God's law. We see this all throughout scriptures, right? I gave you a lot of stories last week, Exodus 1, where uh, Pharaoh said to kill all the babies, right? And the, and the Egyptian midwives hid the Jewish babies in the reeds. That's how Moses got saved. And in Daniel 1, remember in Daniel 1, where Daniel and his friends go to a foreign land, and, and the, the king orders the Jewish boys that are being brought up to be leaders in the culture to eat food that the food laws could, didn't allow them to eat. And so they negotiate with the governing officials to come up with a, an agreeable plan. So they're both shrewd and innocent to violating the law of God. Matthew 10, Jesus said this to the disciples. He said, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and, and innocent as doves. 
You know, I suspect that as Christians, there's more things that we can submit to the government than we realize, right? So leave it as a church, right? When we build a building, when we build a building as a church, we, we actually submit to governments in regards to fire codes and, and city ordinances and protecting the safety of our parishioners inside of our church building. And those, those things are good and we should submit to them. But listen, there may be a day coming that we may have to reject hiring practices that the Bible calls sinful, but the government calls inclusive. Y'all with me on that? And so, you know, we, we submit where we can, we honor where we can, but we only have a responsibility to submit the law of God. Okay, number two, the civil authorities are ordained by God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this was last week's sermon, and I'll let you... Uh, get out of here today and not re-preach that sermon. All right, so Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And we talked about how God is over all governing authorities, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, this is really strong language, but the Lord places governing authorities. It is the governing authority's responsibility to be humble under the mighty hand of God, or God, if he chooses, can remove a governing authority. That was the whole sermon last week. We found it last Sunday. The pastors, all the teaching pastors of our seven campuses went on a retreat We left Sunday after church. It was fascinating to all of us that by Sunday night, the Iranian president had been removed from his office. Yes, those of you all read World Events, and we just preached on that. Like, God can do what God wants to do whenever he wants to do it. All right, number three, third thing I want you to see. How many are like, I can't believe we're on point three. We're going to be grilling out in no time. Okay, so... uh, Point number three, civil authorities are to reward good and punish evil. So our governing officials have an, a responsibility to, to know the difference between good and evil, okay? They have a responsibility to reward good and punish evil. Romans 13, 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good and you'll receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. By the way, I think this is the verse that lets us know we can have a military. We should have a police force. All of these things are ordained for the government to have for he is the servant of God, an avenger, okay, not not Iron Man, okay? He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Okay, a couple things here. Letter A, what does this presuppose? That governing authorities will know God's law and God's character. This presupposes that those in government will know right and wrong as defined by the scriptures. It presupposes that governing authorities will know their sphere of influence that they are supposed to govern and know the things and the spheres of influence that God has already set boundaries around. That's a really bold statement, by the way. This is where when I talk about having a Christian worldview, this is part of our Christian worldview. God has already put boundaries around the church and how it should function. The government doesn't have to speak into that. Yes, the government has put, um, God's word has put boundaries around the family and what a family should look like, right? And so if a family is doing things according to the word of God, the government doesn't have to speak into that. The, 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 the God's word has defined good, morally good and morally evil. And this passage presupposes this, okay? Listen, No society, no matter the style of government, will last if it confuses good and evil, okay? I think for us as Christians, that's part of the the pang we feel when we see where the culture is going, that the culture is so confused about morally good and morally evil. And so, for, but for us as Christians, let her be, our goal as Christians is to promote the kingdom of God, 
Like our goal is to, to at, pray that the government it gives us a peaceful rule that the kingdom of God can be promoted. First Peter 2, 9, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. By the way, this is all like ruling and reigning language. A holy nation. In other words, you're a citizenship of a totally different thing than being American. Our gospel message should not be draped in an American flag. Oof. I told you last week I was going to say something that's going to set all of you at some point, okay? I love our country, and we have a lot to be thankful for, and we're going to honor our military at the end of the service. But we're a part of, as Christians, a part of something different. We're a people, Peter says, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. Listen, church, if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, you're a kingdom of priests. You're not a kingdom of Democrats and Republicans, Promoting the gospel is at the forefront as a priority of a, as a Christian. Our hope and our prayer and our influence should be for a government to govern society in such a way that the promotion of the gospel is seen as a good thing and allowed to proceed freely. Going back to my opening illustration in Daywood, you want to know why they love their king? In a predominantly Muslim country, their king has allowed Christianity to go forward. That's a good thing, right? And so when we talk about, the, you know, a, a Daywood in a predominantly Muslim area, the Middle East, that their country has allowed for the gospel to be promoted, like, we love our king. He's only got to look across the borders and see, you know, what a government does when they, they, don't, when they squash Christianity. You know, your Bible in its original form, was at, Romans is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a local church. So it didn't come with chapters and verses. I don't know if you know that, right? And we do that for ease of preaching and finding our way around the Bible as I'm teaching and preaching. But did you know just a couple paragraphs before Paul writing, and Romans is probably one of the most theological books of the New Testament, unpacking the gospel, 11 chapters of theology, Okay. And then in chapter 12, Paul pivots. He says, you know, now that you're a Christian, I want you to die to yourself and worship God in the way that you live. And in chapter 12 and following, he's like really practical steps of how we live as Christians, including chapter 13, where we're talking about how we respond to the government. But in just a couple paragraphs before that, Paul says this in Romans 12, and I think it ties in here, okay? Very, very important, Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, by the way, this next word is the same word in Romans 13. Never avenge yourselves. That's up to the government, right? They're the ones that have been given the sword as an avenger. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And so our job is to focus on the gospel and let God take care of, our, of the governing official. Now, Wayne Grudem in his book, Politics According to the Bible, says that Christians tend to have one of six responses when it comes to their thinking around the government, okay? And so I'm going to go through these quickly. Number one, some Christians think that the government should compel or put forward a kind of religion, okay? Man, would it be great if the local government promoted the church, a Christian church, or something like that? Some Christians believe, number two, that the government should totally exclude religion. It has nothing to do with religion. It's all about governing the culture and governing a nation. Number three, some Christians believe that the government is evil and demonic. Like, man, it's so bad. Like, I don't even, even want to hear the word government. It makes me throw up in my mouth kind of thing, right? Number four, the church, some Christians think the church should do evangelism and never, never, never talk about politics, okay? Number five, some Christians think the church should talk about politics. Yes, do evangelism, but also talk regularly about politics, all right? And uh, every time I talk about politics, every time I bring up a political point, I get a tear off. I can't believe you're talking about politics, right? And I know you're now number four, okay? So that's where you land. 
And in number six, some Christians believe that the Christians should use all of the influence that God allows them to use to influence the government towards being morally good, okay? So next week, I'm going to get really pragmatic, okay? And I am going to talk about some things that I think we should think about when we steward our vote, and so, but I'm not going to do that this morning. So with that in mind, point number four, here we go. As Christians, what is our response to government or to civil authorities, all right, what is our response to civil authorities? Romans 13, five through seven. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. So letter A, we are to, and I love that in verse 5, Paul uses the word conscience. We are to attempt to live at peace for the sake of conscience, all right? And so in Daniel 1, when Daniel and his friends are asked to eat something that violates the food laws, they don't immediately fly off the handle and go, what are you talking about? We follow God. We can't eat shellfish, okay, or whatever. And they, they, they don't do that. They work with the governing officials and say, hey, we have a different food plan. Can we, can we try this instead and then evaluate us later? Now, now, some Christians, this is where I think we, the river banks of conscience allow for this in our Christian community, all right? So let me, let me give you the river banks, okay? There's some Christians in this church that feel very compelled to be involved in government and speak often about government and say, man, we got to use more of our influence to influence the government, we have some Christians in this church who love Jesus and are working towards the gospel, working together with us for the exaltation of the gospel, that feel like, you know what, we don't really need to talk about government. God's sitting on the throne. He's going to take care of government. I'm just not even going to talk. I don't even know if I should vote, right? And, and these are the riverbanks that were flowing together as the body of Christ. Everybody with me? And I think you should lean based on your matter of conscience. How does the Lord uh, allow me, wire me up? How many of you have heard this quote? And by the way, I'm, before you get all excited, I'm really cautious with this quote. How many of you have heard this quote? The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to what? Do nothing. So you didn't yell it out because you're like, what's he going to say? I'm cautious with that quote because it's not a Bible verse. That verse, that verse, that's usually quoted by a person who is on this riverbank. Y'all with me? Man, we got to get out there. We got to knock on doors. And, and listen, there's room for that as a Christian. But I think when people throw out the, 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 uh, the, the, the quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Evil does not triumph because a perfect man did something, okay? And so when it, whenever that's quoted, I'm like, well, prayer could be doing something. The, the gospel could be doing, promoting the gospel could be doing something. And so we have to be cautious and do things that are, are really a matter of conscience as believers and respect the other person. And by the way, if you're in a small group, you know this, you know where people land on the riverbanks, right? How many of y'all have that person in a small group that every question turns into politics, right? This is about the president. Let me just talk about this, right? How many of y'all have that person in your small group? How many of you are that person in your small group? Like, yes, we're gonna talk, right? And and listen, I'm probably over, most of us are in the middle, you know, of this. I lean a little more this way. I lean a little more this way on the riverbank. Some of you, you are bumping against the riverbank on this side, you know, and some of you are bumping on the riverbank on this side. But there is room for us as believers to, to have a matter of conscience about how much we do or don't want to be involved in government. Everybody with me? 
No, okay, guys, I'll say it again. Until I, y'all with me on that, right? We are to love each other. All right, what's clear in this passage, letter B, is we got to pay our taxes. We got to pay our taxes. I remember when I was like 16, I'd gotten a job, and my boss on payday said, and I quote, I'm going to pay you in cash. I didn't know what that meant. I was like, how else would I get paid? Like, Bitcoin? That didn't exist back then, you know? I now know what that means, all right? How many of y'all know what that means, all right? I'm going to pay you in cash. If you get paid in cash, it is your responsibility as the one getting paid to report that to the government as income. Yes? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, all right. Yes, all right, all right. So if you get tips, you're to report that to the government. And anything in cash is to be reported to the government for us as Christians. Because Jesus said, and this is going to be our main verse next week, we render to the things that are, and we render to God, the things that are God. And did you know in 1 Samuel 8, there's a great, every time I read 1 Samuel 8, man, I like, ah, um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But in 1 Samuel 8, the nation of Israel up to that point had either been ruled by judges or by prophets. And so they didn't have a king. They didn't have a real firm, established form of government, yet they were growing as a nation and being blessed as a nation. And Samuel was a prophet, but the nation of Israel uh, looks at all the other countries around them who have kings, and they begin to clamor for a king. And in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel laments this before God. He's like, God, why can't you just continue to rule them? They don't understand. You're doing a great job. And so Samuel begins to build a, a case with the, king, with the people of Israel, why they shouldn't have a king. He says, if you guys appoint a king, your, your king is, is going to take your kids and send them to war. Your king is going to take the first fruits of your crops and your herds. Your king is going to take the first 10% of everything that you make to himself. And every time I read 1 Samuel 8, I'm like, oh, how I would long for the days of the government only taking 10%. <laughs> right? Because it generally doesn't stop there. Listen, every time I every time I hear a governing official say, hey, the government should fill in the blank. Your mind should go to, the minute we give that to the government, that means something's got to go up. What's got to go up? Taxes have got to go up. Something that's got to get paid for. Or you could be an American citizen and you just rack up $30 trillion in debt, right? Which is, I'm going to talk about this this next week. It's immoral. It's immoral to spend tomorrow's dollars today And so as Christians, it doesn't matter. We are to pay our taxes. By the way, I often wonder, I know your kids are getting fidgety. I'm going to wrap this up, okay? I often wonder if as Christians, inside the law, when you donate to a nonprofit, that's a tax write-off. Praise be to God, right? That's, That's a good thing. But did you know when Jesus said, render to Caesar things are Caesar's and things that God that are God's, and, and when the early church was tithing to their local church, did you know back then there was no tax write-offs? You just rendered to God and you rendered to Caesar. I've often wondered, how, what would the giving do at Coastal Church if the tax write-off went away, Right? Would we still render to God and render to the what God and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? Letter C, Paul says, I want you to respect and honor your leaders. I want you to respect and honor your leaders, not just the ones you voted for, not just the ones you agree with. We are to respect and honor those who disagree with us. Did you know that in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, how many of you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den? How many of you know that story, right? Incredible story. The king 
has some people that want to be Curry the king's favor, but Daniel is rising up in political leadership. God is expanding his influence, and there's other people close to the king that see the king taking Daniel's favor, and they're trying to figure out how to catch Daniel in breaking the law. But Daniel is a great citizen, and he doesn't break the law until these guys over here get with the king and say, you know what, king? There are people in our land that aren't praying just to you. And so why don't you pass a law that anybody that prays to anybody but you, they should be killed. They should be fed to the lions. And the king thinks this is a great idea. What he doesn't know is he's being set up because these enemies of Daniel know that Daniel prays every day. And so the law gets passed, and Daniel does what he does every single day. He goes and prays, and they go, and they get their iPhone out, and they video it. They take it back to the king. They say, look at this. This guy, Daniel, he's violating your law. And the king throws him in the lion's den. And God steps in, and he shuts the mouths of the lions. And the next morning, the king shows up fully expecting to find Daniel dead. And Daniel's not consumed. He opens the den. He says, Daniel, are you in there? And does anybody know what Daniel says next? He honors the king by saying, O king, live forever. This is the guy who threw him into the lion's den. Listen, I read that text, I'm like, if God threw Sean Brown in the lion's den and Sean Brown got protected by God and the president or the king shows up the next day, I'm going to be talking some smack. See, I told you so. I told you my God was bigger than your God, right? But Daniel immediately gives honor and respect to the guy who tried to kill him. It's pretty amazing, right? This is Romans 13. We give honor and respect even if it's the people that we didn't vote for. We honor and respect the position. Every single one of us in this room will spend eternity somewhere. That means that you are created to live forever and ever 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 And ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. How about the song Amazing Grace? When we've been there, how long? 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. What, what, What do we sing next? We've no less to than when we first began. I want to suggest to you that 100,000 years from now, Who was president in 2025 will be an infinitesimal blip on the eternal radar. And the only thing that matters is have you bowed a knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords at the end of the day? So should you be more involved in government? Maybe, sure, fine. Should you be less involved in government? Maybe, sure, fine. But here's the one thing I know. At the end of the day, Philippians 2, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And if you do it after this life, it will be to condemnation. But if you do it in this life, it will be to eternal reward forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I want you to know King Jesus. Amen? Amen. Make that the main thing. So here's what I want to do. We want to give honor this morning because the scriptures tell us to honor the right things and the right people. Um. This weekend is Memorial Day weekend. We have an incredible country, guys, by the way. We're really, really blessed. We have a lot of freedom to promote the gospel, and uh, we should be thankful for that. Amen? Amen. Um, And that freedom is guarded by the government who bears the sword, right? And uh, as the leading, as our leadership determines, and so... Uh, We have men and women that have actually died in combat serving this country, and that's what Memorial Day is about. So if you're here this morning 
and you have a family member that has given their life in serving this country, would you stand? We want to honor you and your family, okay? Okay, great. Stay standing too, great. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Man, we honor what your family has given up and sacrificed for our country. Is there anybody in this room that is retired military? Would you stand? Thank you for serving the country. Retired military. Men and women. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Anybody in... Oh, good. Thank you. Anybody active military? Any active military? Reserves. Active military reserves. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's honor these folks. We love you. Stay standing. We're going to pray. And uh, thank you. All right. Let's bow our heads and pray. How about that? Heavenly Father, we are mindful of, we know all freedom is grounded in the freedom of the gospel. The scriptures are very clear. We'll know the truth. The truth sets us free. And um, so we're really, really grateful for a lot of reasons. Uh, But one of them is... uh, the freedom to worship you. I'd even We live in a very diverse country, and that's, that is a hard kind of country to govern, God. It takes, it takes a lot of wisdom and careful thought uh, to govern a nation as diverse as ours. But one of the things that we get to do, God, is to gather corporately and praise you, and that requires the government that bears the sword. And we have men and women that have defended those freedoms, Lord. Some have given their life, and so we're really, really grateful for those who stood up right away, who, uh, man, their families have made, you know, in some ways the ultimate sacrifice of giving their life for this country. Thank you for the retired men and women in this room that served many for 20 plus years. And thank you for the active duty, God. And uh, we know that military service can really strain a family, and uh, especially when they get called into action or sometimes have to go overseas, God. And so we thank you for men and women have served this great country. God, today I want to focus, last week we focused on local leaders. This week I want to focus on the federal government, God, for our congressmen and women, our president, President Joe Biden, God. I pray that he would be a man that seeks you, that uses godly wisdom to lead, a man of character. He humbles himself under the mighty hand of God. God, I want to thank you for the many, many blessings that we have. But God, we also recognize that as Christians, we have an obligation to take the gospel to to the nations, Lord. And different nations, uh, I guess, do it different than the way we do it, God. And so we want to be loving and welcoming to all uh, with the hope of exalting the gospel of Jesus Christ so that a person's eternity can be secured forever and ever and ever to the day that we're living under the rule and reign of a perfect king, God, and there will be perfect peace. And that is going to be an amazing time. And until then, God, we look forward to that day, the day that our faith becomes sight. And God, on Memorial Day weekend, we we think about uh, the ultimate sacrifice was Christ taking on flesh and paying a debt he didn't know, God, that we might have freedom from sin and death and have the hope of abundant and eternal life. And so, God, we're going to go out singing gratitude. We are genuinely thankful for all of your blessings. James tells us that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights above. And so we want to go out praising you and thanking you this morning. And it's in Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen.